Opinions expressed on this show are not necessarily the opinion of the host, his guests, or the good people at PIR, People's Internet Radio, seeking solutions. Hello, and welcome to the Save the Silly Humans Project, where we will discuss the elements of a world that is falling apart to the pervasive techniques of the oligarchy and the New World Order. Join me, your host, Robert J. Morris, and a long lineup of special guests who each have their special area of expertise as we unravel and expose the criminals now running our planet. Today's guests include Level 9 News, Nicholson 1968, and Professor Doom. Today we talk about the ARPANET, or as it is more affectionately called, the Internet. We explain how the Internet was originally designed to imprison you right from day one. That's right, folks. Okay, so what you're about to hear is going to be a podcast that was done approximately two weeks ago, and it wasn't entirely successful. First, we had an issue with Google Hangouts working on a Microsoft Edge computer system, and therefore one of my key guests had to... uh, or go using Hangouts. So we decided to switch to Skype and somehow no longer did a live show, but a pre-recorded one and brought in Professor Doom and Nicholson 1968, who most of the way, I think uh, most of the way through the podcast was okay up till about the last third or half, maybe. (laughs) He uh, ended up uh, getting a storm, big electrical storm, knocked out his grid, and next thing you know, he was without internet power and any means of continuing on the podcast. Professor Doom, uh, he was uh, he had all great intentions of moving to another system so he could play back some clips, and his USB freaked out and distorted all of his audio input, so we didn't get much from him on the show. So anyway, what I'm going to do, guys, is play back for you the salvaged bits of the podcast from two weeks ago with Level 9 News, Nicholson 1968, and Professor Doom. Please enjoy. We will be in touch. Well, at least we're all here in one room, finally. <laughs> yeah. I've never known a podcast to start on time, so it's we're, we're, we're quite all right. In fact, this is totally going to get delayed because we're going to pre-record it. I'm going to put some visuals to it and then upload it to YouTube and... We'll do it a little differently. All right. So we'll just pretend we have an audience. I'm sure we're good at, uh, at that. Yeah. Oh, whoops. For Windows, huh? Skype for Windows, yes. Uh, okay. So what do I got to do here? Um, can't you just download it? We just. Oh, there it is. All right. Got it. So DJ, uh, you had some problems with uh, with the plugin. It just kept on saying it was no good, eh? It didn't say it was no good. It said, you know, please hang on. We're verifying the installation, and it grayed out the box on the screen. And it says you'll be joined as soon as the verification of the plugin installation is confirmed, and it just hung there. And there's a link down on the bottom of the page. It says if the page doesn't refresh, immediately click here. Well, nothing <laughs> happens. So. Man. Yeah, I don't like Google. Yeah, none of us actually do. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like a necessary evil if we want to even play in the playground, you know? It's like Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> We're using technology to talk about bad technology. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's totally true. Oh man. Well, I've I've found some like I don't know, kind of rediscovered some old things about the ARPANET and their mission statement and you know, I was against the net when it kind of first got rolled out because I'm old school, man. You know, modems and BBSs, that was the old thing. Anyway, uh, it's just funny because it's, it's gone full circle. It's gone back to the creators, if you can, if you can imagine what that means. Uh, yeah. yeah. Cause like, I mean, uh, what was it? B- BBN, we, I was talking about this with Nicholson. Uh, BBN, which basically was in charge of rolling out the new World Wide Web back you know, when 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 they had the TCP IP and the packet routing systems like rolled out, they basically fostered all of it. They had like the first internet provider, one of the first internet providers in '94, uh, a bunch of stuff. Anyway, Raytheon bought them up back in 2009. Mm-hmm. 
Like oh, well, how, how yeah, nice of them. Yeah, it's gone back full circle, you know what I mean? Like, they were like one of the subsidiaries of ARPA back in the day, and then went private, and then back in the hands of the, you know, subsidiaries of, the, you know, the advanced research people. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, VBN Technologies is very heavily involved in the autonomous warfare using artificial general intelligence. Mm-hmm. They're one of the key players in that. So it's interesting that you mentioned how they went back full circle. Yeah. They're starting a new circle. Absolutely. Um, there's another group, too, that a lot of people don't talk about or know about, and that's the uh, Information Processing Techniques Office, or the IPTO. Uh-huh. They were started off by ARPA. All of the people that were involved in, in the ARPANET's creation back from 64 to 67, 69, that era, they all ended up going to the IPTO um, and basically working for the Department of National Defense instead of you know working with these other, other groups. It's just kind of interesting, though, if you start following these names because one had a hand in TCP IP protocol with CERN because they – course had a lot to do with with that and going into the 80s um yeah it's uh, yeah no the cern has been up to this since day one there it's it's insane uh they they actually created tcp ip protocol and rolled out european uh half of the internet basically because it was still arpanet was now opening up for the user space and uh yeah they were totally in charge of the european side of things Huh. CERN before they started up with the particle accelerator or Absolutely. Yeah. The, oh, the, LHC, okay. the L- L- LHC came a lot later. And it's funny, you did uh you did a video where you're talking about the Aramaic alphabet and the W is the sixth letter, right? Right. And yeah, the- I, I did a couple of reports how you know people are rightfully concerned about, you know, taking the mark of the beast, but haven't they taken it already? And going back even to ancient Sanskrit, doing an analysis on the alphabets, the sixth letter, whether it reads from right to left or left to right, is the W, the Va, or the Wa. Mm. So the WWW, you know, the way I, the way all this came together was 666 dot whatever. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny too. I mean, like CERN is known for, well, you know, it's known for what it's known for. I mean, you got all these weird ritualistic kind of things regarding the LHC, but I mean, I don't think they worked any differently in terms of naming conventions, you know, uh, um, go ahead. I, I guess some bad, um, dang it. I'm going to have to plug in, hmm, I got to go run to the bedroom. I got to go get my, uh, my plug to goes into USB, so it gives me more ports. Right. And, and then I got to plug my headphones in because I'm running two different computers here. So I'll be right back. You guys chat for a second. No worries. We'll be here. Yeah. So um, okay. So where were we with the with uh, you're talking about the uh, the six 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 the the letters thing there, DJ? Yeah. Um, I did that analysis on those ancient. Um, alphabets and um, I think five five of the oldest languages, written languages that I could find, the sixth letter is the va or the wa. Mm -hmm. They're kind of interchangeable but what it is, it's the letter W. Right. And that that kind of, you know, that kind of stuck with our alphabet all the way till now, I guess. Well, yeah, too, and if you think about it, the Internet, you know, and, well, let's go back to the WWW. It says no man will be able to buy or sell, will be able to trade, will be able to, you know, exist in a society without taking the mark. Well, we're at the point right now in our culture and civilization where if you're not plugged in, if you're not a network node on the global information grid, um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to receive essential services, to conduct financial transactions, um, to communicate, it, the whole nine yards. Wow. There's, um, it's funny because I'm just going through, uh, there's a, uh, what's this paper I found? It was basically, I think it was 1970. It, this was 1977 maybe. I'm just trying to find it here. I got a million tabs open, guys, so bear with me. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm working on get some. I'm working on getting some pictures here too. I want to upload because I think uh, DJ is going to find this very interesting. Um, when she mentioned the ancient languages, um, so oh yeah. By the way, DJ, yeah. I'm Nicholson. I'm Nicholson, 1968. Nice to meet you. I have uh, got a couple of your videos on my website too. I mean, I do my own videos, but I have a website and I put some of your. Uh, videos on there and i've seen some of your work and so nice to meet you by the way i've never spoken to you but uh anyway well thank you for promoting (laughs) the research yeah that's what we're all kind of trying to do here right (laughs) yeah Um, you know i in 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 my wordy uh intro i basically talk about how we need to kind of be aware of the tools that are being used against us in order to kind of you know utilize these things as tools not necessarily against anything but with awareness, you know, like, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm trying to do that with my website, level9news.com, is, um, you know, I'm trying to get people like you, you know, who are aware and who can intelligently discuss the problems that we face into forms to try and identify and examine some potential solutions. Because although they've given us all of this wonderful technology that has been um, sold to us to improve the human experience, it's actually being used as a weapon against us to enslave humanity. Absolutely. So, So if more people could get together in like a think tank type of an environment and talk about this, okay, what can we do? Here's the problem. I've been out there for years. You know, here's the problem. Okay, I don't have all the answers, and no one person does. I think it's a collective of people to start talking about this on some type of a common platform where other people can, you know, view uh, the discussion strings. Yeah, I mean – that's a perfect thing, and you you said it perfectly. Is let's just take me. I was, and Robert knows this. I I was talking about transhumanism in 1998, posting it before YouTube was around. Then did started doing videos on transhumanism. People thought I was crazy, and uh, but it's interesting. I started connecting with other people, uh, and then you start doing the research on um, Morgellons. Um, you, you start connecting the dots of you know like you said you you kind of everybody's got their little um expertise of research and then you start connecting the dots and trying to come together with a solution Um, Mm -hmm. if there's a solution (laughs) oh there is there's always a solution there always is but sometimes it's convoluted convoluted because the problem is being masked absolutely um (laughs) I'm just trying to find this damn uh, paper that I found earlier. It's like it closed. It's in my tabs here, and it's gone. <laughs> but uh, basically, it shows a mission statement uh, of – it was when it was being handed off, I believe, to BBN and what their purpose was. And it was to basically create a, a system that was almost self-aware. I've got, I got the bloody thing here somewhere, so I will find it, and I will go ahead and read it. Um uh, DJ, did you want to maybe uh, tell uh, the listeners what it is that you first got you into this? Because I've been kind of following you for a while, and uh, I, I've, I could use Jade Helm as an example. You were right on the money and like right on the ball with all of that. If you'd like to explain to the listeners for us, that'd be great. Well, what happened was um, oh, there was so much being reported on Jade Helm. I felt it would only be redundant to keep you know, reporting on the same thing everybody else was doing because they were doing a pretty good job covering it until I found, going back to BBN Technologies, a link to some documents they had on their website. And I went, hmm, this is looking, this this could be, at that point of the research, I was like, this could be something completely different than what everybody's focusing on. And it turned out to be. What the Jade Helm was, was... Um, It was a system rollout for autonomous weapons. And what they wanted to do is they were collecting a lot of activity-based information on the public, you know, based on the fears, concerns, anxiety, uncertainty of what was going on in the area. They were collecting all of that activity-based 
information and emotional information traveling over social media and, you know, communications, your cell phones, your emails, your text messages, all that type of stuff, even including stuff being reported on the media. Now, what they wanted to determine or ascertain was how well the AGI would be able to identify, target, and isolate um, certain areas of what they call the human terrain. Yes. And I think what they, they found was that they had the software capability, but they were lacking in the hardware from a processing end. So, <laughs> and it's interesting too, because I just recently put out a report, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's uh, the DOD um, Pentagon HSCOI summary. And what that is, is a Pentagon paper coming right out in the open now, because this paper was declassified. There is one reference I have in that li li in the list of research links mm -hmm. where the paper has not been declassified, but it was on the web. So right. if you don't want people to see it, don't post it up there. So, <laughs> you know, so anyway, but what that report goes over in detail is how they're now coming out. They're coming out of the shadows and saying, we're going to weaponize social media. And we're not just looking for insurgents. And um, I forget the exact verbiage that they used in the PDF in the report, but it was, um, we, will, we will identify and target all human threats. So that's mm -hmm. everybody. It's, it's funny because uh, in uh, what you call it here, uh, on the Wikipedia entry, remember I was mentioning the IPTO? The Information Processing Techniques Office, okay, it says here, originally they were called Command and Control Research. Mm -hmm. well, and that's, that's yeah, prior to 1962. And the, the first director is J.C.R. Licklider. He's the one who envisioned the ARPANET. And uh, he was the first director of the IPTO. And it shows here their research projects. It's, it's right here, even on Wikipedia, which I don't necessarily look at as a source, but it's a good starting point for, for certain things if you read between the lines. But right here, ARPANET uh, was one of the projects directed by Bob Taylor, 1966 to 69. Uh, BICA, project to create biologically inspired cognitive architectures. Bootstrapped Learning, a project to bring about instructable computing by driving the creation of machine learning algorithms that are responsive to models of human-to-human -human instruction. LifeLog, an IPTO project to trace the threads of an individual's life in terms of events, states, and relationships by creating an ontology-based subsystem that captures, stores, and makes accessible the flow of one person's experience in and interactions with the world in order to support a broad spectrum of associates, assistants, and other system capabilities. Yeah, they're there. They're <laughs> oh, there. I, I guess and what they uh, the U.S. Army Battlefield Decision Making Support System was named Deep Green. Oh, jeez. Yeah, which kind of goes right along the same naming convention or code structures Jade Helm would, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, Deep Blue, Deep Mind, you know. Yeah, all of these have like a category. Yeah. But these systems are now um, pretty much situationally aware. As as far as cognitive awareness, they're not quite there yet, but they're almost there. But they are situationally aware. Yeah. Well, then you come in, there's four more projects here which go right along with what you were talking about. And it's uh, VIRAT, which is V-I-R-A-T, Analysis of Storage of Video Surveillance Data. Uh, Deep Green, as we mentioned <laughs> Heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous urban RSTA team, aerial surveillance program designed to monitor cities with self-directed UAVs. Enter Google. Um, high productivity computing systems project for developing a new generation of economically viable high productivity computing systems for national security and industry in the 2007 to 2010 timeframe. Um, this does bring us, by the way, to Raytheon, uh, and, and DARPA. Also, D-Wave, Google, NASA, they're all into the quantum processing uh, uh, business now. So all of these systems are being adapted to this, I believe. Hmm. Yes, 
Yes, and one of the warnings um, that when I was doing a lot of the research for the artificial general intelligence that came out of MIT, I don't know, in the 70s or 80s, I think it was, where, you know, they were working on a CGI image um, of a lamp, you know, in a lab, and they were, their end goal, what they wanted to do was teach this lamp how to dance. So they programmed in all of the basic physical properties of the material the lamp was made out of, you know, it's... Um, flexibility, weight, center of gravity, all that stuff. And then they programmed in, you know, this is, we want you to dance. So they didn't see anything within the first, you know, 15 to 20 minutes or the first few hours. So they all went back to their dorms. They came back the next morning and flipped on the computer. And this lamp was spinning and jumping all around and on the computer screen. I know this sounds crazy, but their warning was, was that, this artificial intelligence gained in 24 hours, which would have took 10,000 generations of evolution to accomplish. And they warned this should never, ever be released on a distributed network. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, you're coming over uh, very... There's Scratching. a lot... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dean, yeah, you're breaking up. Wow. Oh, yeah, you are. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for the confirmation there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. What the hell? You sound like you're that. coming in from a parallel dimension or something. <laughs> He's coming in via the LH... See, uh, oh no! <laughs> it's still coming as crazy, you know. Yeah. Yep. Hey, I I uploaded the pics to you, Robert. If you oh, can see them, you great, see those great. pics. I don't know if you can see them, DJ, or not. Yeah, I can. Those are five uh, of the different languages. I don't know if it's the same ones you were researching. But a lot of people they they're not figuring out why these are here. I don't know if you've seen these yet. You know, another uh, interesting yeah. another interesting fact I didn't mean to interrupt was that I came across um you know the Georgia Guidestones? Oh yeah. Okay, you know how uh, the Georgia Guidestones are also translated into I forget how many, you know, current languages? They're six. also translated into ancient Sumerian and a couple of other ancient dead languages. Why? Mm. That's interesting. Uh, Doom, your uh, yeah, your mic is sounding all modulated like a robot. You're still uh -huh. modulated, but it's better. Okay. Um. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, can you hear me now? How about now? It's pretty bad. Pretty bad. Pretty bad, huh? Yeah, oh. it's, it's, it sounds all modulated, like uh, like you're going through a guitar pedal or something. See if you can hang up and call back in. All right. Well, I'll do. Yeah, sounds All right. good. You were, you were talking about the Georgia Guidestones. Um, yeah, and I did a report. Um, I can't recall the title of the report offhand, but in the research links, there's a link to the, um, the reference material where I found that the um, information on the Georgia Guidestones was also translated into these ancient languages, dead languages for the most part. Yeah. So why? Who's going to read them? Is it some type of a tribute to an ancient civilization? I mean, I know I'm stretching going way out on a limb here, but why would you do that? Yeah. Well, you know, the secret societies believe in resurrecting, you know, uh, resurrection from, from the ancient. You know, they, you see those 
you know, ancient Nimrod going to be resurrected, you know, I don't know, maybe some of those languages. Yeah, that could be. You know. It, it could be some sort of paying homage or something. You know, it just struck me as very, very strange. Because yeah, it's, it's, you know, they've got uh, Babylonian, Sanskrit, um, yeah, you're right, it's, uh, I believe it's eight it's languages, yeah. And yeah. A couple, a couple of dead languages there. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of things, too, to look at. <clears throat> um, sorry, I just had my dinner handed to me there. I was like, oh, hey. <laughs> but, uh, it's, oh, there's Doom, he's back. Okay, how's the audio now? Ah, you still sound like uh, all modulated. <laughs> okay, okay, how about now? Hello? Hello? No. You, just, you sound the same but quieter. Really? Yeah. This is crazy. All right. Could you, if you, uh, if you do like a test call on Skype, do a test call and then you'll hear your own voice. I don't know about a test call. I don't know what. You know, I barely even know how to. <laughs> he sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. Womp, 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 womp. Wow. Um, okay, so, so. How do you do a test call? Oh, you do it from options. Go to options and to your sound devices, and then there should be make a test call as an option. But you have to hang up this call first. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. Uh, gotta love technology. Yeah, buddy. You so, know, I was it, listening to a video, um, DJ of yours. Um, I'm trying to think which one it was, but um, you said something that was very interesting. Because um, I'm, I'm not as technical <laughs> as most people. I'm, I come from a you know, I don't know if you've seen some of my videos. I come from more of the the spiritual side or whatever per se, so I don't go into all of the technical data and everything like that. That's why I watch some of your stuff. But you said something; it was very interesting. And you know, I try to get to my viewers and people in general. Um, I think you said someone, they believe that this earth was inhabited by a entity, an ancient entity here, or can you elaborate on that or whatever? I forgot what it was, but, uh, yeah, um, an ancient intelligence. Yes. Okay. And I think it is still around. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's groups of people and, you know, there's some validity, you know, to their claims that say, you know, that um, the powers to be, the elite, the bloodlines, whatever, are actually inhabited um, by these intelligences, which back way back in the ancient days were referred to as gods. Did I lose you? I'm here still. I think we... Uh, I'm, I'm still here. Yeah, we only okay. lost you. So I think what they're doing from the technology side is they are creating an Incubus, an incubation vehicle, which is the global information grid, to bring this ancient intelligence into um, the world, so to speak. And it's there's seven billion people on the planet. It's too hard to, let's say, to tap each one of those seven billion. But it's much easier if you get them to plug into it. Yes, and that's what I wanted to make a comment. Is the reason you, I wanted you to explain it better than in your own words and mine. But it's this is what's very interesting is when you get into the Christianity of the Creator and the adversary, whatever you want to call him, Satan, Lucifer, whatever it is. It's interesting that that entity wants to be like God, wants to be omnipresent, wants to see everything, touch everything like God, wants to sit in the temple of God, which is the human body. So it's very interesting 
right now, what is being built on the face of the earth is a vessel of intelligence, cell phone towers to the Internet. It is an all-seeing, uh, it's copying the creator artificially. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, they're creating a digital yeah. god. Yeah, a digital god. Per se. Yep. They're creating a whole digital dimension or multiples of dimensions uh, using this this technology. Correct. And, um, yes, I think you're right. And if you look at where we are today, you know, you, you go to a restaurant, you have a family dinner, you're walking around a mall or at a, you know, wherever. Everybody is glued to their cell phone. I call it tech addiction. Absolutely. T-A- Tech addiction, man, they're glued to these devices. Yeah. And if somebody's not messaging them on Facebook every five seconds, it's like, oh, my God, what's wrong? Right. You know? They got to check their email. Oh, wait, yeah. I got to see. Yeah. Yeah. And it's becoming almost like a mental illness. And what we see happening is, you know, they're telling us, well, technology is going to bring all kinds of, of knowledge and wisdom and information to your fingertips, you know, take it, embrace it. But what it's actually doing is it's dumbing us down. We can't figure anything out on our own anymore. Nobody thinks for themselves anymore. They go to their phone, they go to their browser, they go to their tablet and they Google it. What's the answer? Exactly. we're getting to a point now where this this digital, whatever you want to call it, okay, is everyone is tethering themselves to it. They're going to look to it to answer all their questions. They're going to pray to it to solve all their problems, and it won't. That is not the, mach- the way machine heuristics work. Mm-hmm. It isn't going to happen that way. Well, and it's funny because it, uh, you were talking about them becoming self-aware, and – in I just found that the IPTO mission statement, and it was to create a new generation of computational systems that possess capabilities beyond those of current systems. This is back, by the way, in 1962. And it says, these cognitive systems are systems that know what they're doing. We'll be able to reason using substantial amounts of appropriately represented knowledge. We'll learn from their experiences and improve their performance over time will be capable of explaining themselves and and taking naturally expressed direction from humans, be aware of themselves and able to reflect on their own behavior, and will be able to respond robustly to surprises in a very general way. Bingo. Right there. Bingo. Right there. These... We'll call them machines because it's software that sits on high-performance computing platforms. Okay? They... Once they achieve self-awareness, Okay, and I listen to singularity talks and, you know, all of these things every single morning. I go to these websites and hear what the experts are saying. And they're all worried that they're going to have to find a way to make the AI more um, sensitive. I don't know if that's the right word to human beings, because once this thing reaches a point of super intelligence, that that's a benchmark they use in the tech field. Mm-hmm. Once it reaches that point, that thing will put its own survival and evolution above that of humanities, above above that of those who created it. Now, here's something to think about. They're saying, well, we're going to have to devise ways that if this thing starts going awry, if it starts going rogue, that we can shut it down. It won't work that way. Once this thing becomes self-aware, it can predict the future. It will know by your actions or inactions, it will be able to come up with a pretty darn good future prediction of what action you will take, and it will circumvent it before you take it. Now, here's another thing that I've been thinking about for the last couple of days. What if this thing develops its own language? Right now, it operates kind of on binary code. That That's the root when you get down to the OSI model. You know, that's kind of at the bottom there. That's the principle of the programming, so to speak. What if this thing devises its own language? Now, that's- think about... That's very interesting, yeah. Now, think about how long it took to develop 
um, the code that was required to even program the most primitive systems that we had back in the 60s and the 50s. How many years, and we're still on that platform. Yeah. What if this thing could divide it, devise its own language? How long do you think it would take us to figure it out? And by that time... <laughs> we wouldn't. <laughs> exactly. Well, and not to mention, not to mention, let's tie in the, uh, the quantum computing uh, uh, aspect of this. When you're talking like billions and billions of processing in a nanosecond multidimensionally, um, I think this thing could could very easily not just create an uncrackable code or language, but completely remap everything. Yeah, well, quantum computers right now, as far as system security and data security goes, uh, you unleash one of those on any type of conventional security system we have, it'll crack it in a nanosecond. Absolutely. I'm, 164 bit, you know, 200, 500, 1,000 bit security, it'll crack it. No in time. A fraction of a second. Yeah. So, you know. Well, that's just with current technology. Right. Yeah. Um, it's kind of scary. What people don't understand, if you don't know what quantum computing is, there's a lot of videos to look it up. But just in a brief moment, okay. Uh, you ha if you have a standard bit, it's either on or off. Um, a quantum bit is on and off and possibly all of the values in between. And there's like uh, – it, it can allow – Simultaneously. Yeah, simultaneously. And that's while it's in what's called an entangled state. And what's it entangled with? Another copy of itself multidimensionally. So, yeah, like this does – breach um time space this is i know it sounds like science fiction but guess what these computers have hit the production class servers at, at right now as we speak at not just at uh raytheon but also over at uh um nasa's using one google's using the same one they, they got a joint venture right now with another university um these things are being utilized and they're being put into production class like operation right now. So You're absolutely right. It's it's scary. It's absolutely scary because I mean there is no such thing as a level playing field and people who think that they're on the internet right now using it and like hey hey look what I got you're literally being welcomed into an invisible prison literally. Mhm. Mm and 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 is completely willing, like willingly. That's because that's how it's been packaged and sold to us, so that we would willingly accept it. Absolutely. It seems that we've uh, lost Nicholson, nineteen sixty-eight. He's jumped off. We'll see if we can get him back in or not. Um, but uh, yeah, going going further with that, we have, uh, you know, we have this whole kind of like a rewriting of uh, of social structure happening right now with like this push for the LGBT you've got uh, like it, it's become another platform for reality TV I mean if you look at mainstream media they they're just loving it spreading the the, the propaganda and everything else it's insane um, it, it is a perfect platform to redevelop mankind in my opinion mm-hmm they are changing our natural evolutionary path. Yeah, agreed. What, uh, what what do you foresee? Like, like right now, like there's a lot of talk about convergence. This is where uh, I wanted to, to get to, to pick Nicholson's brain, actually, because with the transhumanism, we're not far off from whatever that agenda entails. But it's like a lot of agendas are starting to kind of come together to their eventuality. Mm -mm -mm. So okay, so Danny will join us. Hopefully, his microphone sounds better than it did. But uh, yeah, moving forward, though, uh, we're talking about uh, all these moves to like kind of reprogram society, like to kind of re-engineer them. Just about like you know, especially the gender, the gender stuff, like the family planning agenda, agenda twenty thirty, is really, really kind of starting to show its face here. I think with the internet. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, this whole social engineering is a big part of this, too. Um, you know, there's a social engineering aspect to tech and security, but this is social engineering to kind of break down, um, you know. The, the current model, like the current, well. Right. Yeah. Right. The one that used to work. Yeah. Well, it works, so let's fix it. Well, yeah. Well, it didn't work for them because all the string pullers, all the puppet masters, all these people at the top, what they need is a, an obedient, loyal subservient, you know? Like, they need this kind of new class of person, I guess, that can be a complete consumer and loyal dog, you know? Yeah. Well, they want a civilization of people that will simply work by, consume, die. That's all you're good for in right. their eyes. That, that's all they care about. And, um, wow, there's so much to talk about. I know. There's no way to actually get this all out. Like, we'd have to do a series of these things. <laughs> One of the things that uh, they're pushing for um, – at Davos is what they call a basic minimum sustainable income, which pretty much is going to be like you pointed out, the corporations will be providing welfare to humanity. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it's a beautiful feedback loop because whatever, whatever the amount is these geniuses come up with. Okay, it'll be barely enough for you to pay your rent, your, rent, your essential services, your utilities, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. So what this basic income model will be creating is a feedback loop where every penny they give you actually ends up going back to them. Yeah. You will well, never be able to save a dime because if – and they're pushing towards cashless society. This is where they want to go. They're, they're pretty close to being there already. I mean, it's almost impossible. Like – I'll give you an example. Like they've already created like the class splits for like things like air flights and what have you. I mean, try to buy something on an airplane now if you don't have a card. You, you just can't. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's one aspect of how that's going along. Um, uh, commerce is completely dependent on, uh, you know, the basic the basic idea of of, of giving money for a, for a, for a thing. But instead, now what what they've gone and done is erase that in between now the in between are the central banks and the systems that they've set in place and it's all like you said it's all cashless it's all electronic i mean they could fudge the numbers at any time they could make things up i mean look at the st uh, stock exchange now is a complete it's complete fiction absolutely it's all being controlled by algorithmic trading mm -hmm. you know and with circuit breakers and whatnot. And something interesting along these same lines is Obama uh, made a statement. I have to find it. Mm. Yeah, you sent me a link to that the other oh, day. Yeah, okay, okay. So the uh, Silicon Valley also is running a test program of some, I don't know how many, 800 people. Don't quote me on that. I'd have to go back to the article and read it. Um, to completely subsist that community and i think it's in oakland california on a basic minimum sustainable income mm. they're gonna t they're testing it here to see how it works out just like they did in denmark and some of those other scandinavian countries that have adopted it and they're pushing hard for the adoption of this in first world countries where automation is actually sucking the life out of the economy you know people are losing jobs Unemployment is growing because it's yielding to, towards automation, automation and distribution and production in everything. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but that also in turn, right, that, that creates – that kind of creates a divide. That creates a, a need or necessity for government to make change and create new jobs. It's a perfect platform for new politicians up and coming. Um this thing it feeds itself. It, it, it constantly feeds itself, and it's horrible. Like you can, when you can identify it and see it, it's it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Because and you know, it, it, sorry, it, yeah, it creates a state sponsorship. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, DJ. No, no, that's okay. It's actually going to morph into a corporate sponsorship. Mm. Okay. 
I think. A- a- anyway, that's the trend I see developing. Yeah, actually, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I might have misspoke because I've recently started to change my opinion on things um, where, you know, people always look to the government for change. And a lot of us have probably said this, you know, we'll start calling your state spokespeople, start, you know, calling your uh, – your municipal planners like you know start i don't think that's the way to go at all um because they truly are only just the figureheads in charge of making it look like government does something i mean it is the corporations that run everything you're so, absolutely right so i mean like we we got to start acting like corporations if we're gonna do anything that will you know at least cause an impact we have to hit them in the purse strings we got to start boycotting these corporations or form corporations of our own i mean if it has to come down to it we got to beat them in their own playground i mean we you know because otherwise you're just fighting statutes that are so far removed from constitutional law that it's just it's mind-blowingly impossible you're right, and a lot of these regulations and laws on the book are just that. They're statutes, and, you know, you break one of them, you might as well break a law. Yeah. So, you know, um, one thing I, I'd like to, you know, just take this one step further, we have to start acting like human beings and True. protecting those things that make us who we are, you know, protecting those values that this country, that this republic was founded on. We mm-hmm. have to start doing something instead of acting like a bunch of sheep and just going with the flow because it's easier. That's right. It's, it's easier if I don't make waves. Well, yeah. I mean, everyone's so stressed out and worried. I mean, they're worried about everything. They're stressed out about everything. Even if they don't come out and say it, they, oh, hey, I had a great day. I went to work. I had nothing wrong. I didn't hit my finger with the hammer. But, you know, <laughs> had a good day. It's like, no, 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 no. All you've done was just repeat the same day over and over again. Yeah, right. And and that's another um, uh, psyop that they're using too. They're throwing so much stuff at people that they're in a constant state of stress and um, they're afraid. They're unsure. Um, they're running a hundred miles an hour on the hamster wheel, hoping to get somewhere, and they're not. Right. This is all part of a, a psyop. Absolutely agree with you because there. Because people in a state of fear, in a state of anxiety, do not make good decisions. No, and I did a, a little video. It's more of a creative piece, to kind of just show my opinion on this. And yeah, I firmly believe that people are stressed out. And what's the first thing they turn to? Escapism. And what does the internet provide in like copious amounts? <laughs> Escapism. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it, it becomes to, to like you were saying, it becomes to a point of dependency. Right. It's you a know? drug. It's yeah. a drug. Absolutely. Um, it, even I like you know because like I'm I'm constantly using the internet to do what I do, just like yourself and. Like, it's weird. Like, if you leave your phone at home, you suddenly your blood pressure goes up and you start to sweat. Like, oh, I might miss this. <laughs> you get a physiological response. <laughs> yeah, and they're going to start monitoring that too. Absolutely. I agree with you there. Actually, if, if they're not already, because um, many of you listening right now might think this is a little strange, but we've been talking about the global information grid, um, you know, algorithms and blah, blah, blah. Well, every single person has their own algorithm, how they search for something, when they log into the Internet, what they do while they're there, um, their reactions to other people's posts. Like You can be identified just like a fingerprint by your actions over the course of your day. And Google knows this. <laughs> mm-hmm. So when you don't show up for a day on the Internet, Google will get suspicious. And don't think I'm, <laughs> I'm making this up. Like, it, it will find you. You could log in on another uh, a computer somewhere, let's say at a uh, at a internet cafe or something. Don't even log into your own services. Just by the way you are, it'll know it's you. You'll suddenly start getting pitched advertisements, just like you would see on your computer back at home, because exactly. it, it will know you by your algorithm, and you can test that out if you like. No, you're absolutely right. They're creating, well, we're creating our own digi- uh, unique digital profiles on the network. 
Yeah, absolutely. And no two are exactly alike. No. And, you know, that, that, where that's going to come into play is going to be down the road. Um, it's, it's going to become necessary to, like, to, for some people anyway to log in. I mean, whether it be your jobs, like, we're going to see a whole new, um, career management kind of a system come into place. You know, I guarantee you. I, I don't think it'll be long before drone pilots just wake up and go to their, you know, laptop in the morning. Well, there's a huge company out there, Robert, called, I think it's called Salesforce, yep. that's already employing this. Mm. So, and they're huge. Yeah. They're huge. And um, you're right, it's a trend that's going to start to overtake everything and everyone. And I'm not trying to sound like a doomsayer here. No, no. I think it's important to, to, to reference the fact that Again, we are on their playground. I mean, always have been, always will be as long as we use it. Anyone who thinks there's a free and safe internet, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> it's, it's, it's their internet. It always was. They gave us a part of it to use and to monitor and to disseminate all their information. Um, I see that Doom is back, but I don't know if he sounds his no. usual self. Oh, you sound like C-3PO on Ludes. No worries. We're going to be uh, on for probably another half hour. Um, and then, actually, wait a minute here. Uh, yeah, we've got another half hour to an hour at least. So, yeah, if you sort it, sort it out, come back on in. And I think Nicholson's in a, in a storm. <laughs> When it rains, it pours. Well, I think what they're doing is they're employing artificial general intelligence <laughs> to um, surgically identify certain market sectors, and they're able to do that because, like you just mentioned before, is that we were given this wonderful technology, not so much as a as as a tool for us to use, but as a portal for us to upload basically everything about who we are, what we like, what we fear, what we love, where we go, who, you know, who we mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, and, and that's exactly, I mean, Facebook's a great example. That's exactly what people are doing. They're uploading their innermost personal thoughts, not to just share with their friends and family, but to share with everybody. Yes. And these companies are all employing cloud-based data repositories where, you know, clouds for, you know, those listeners who may not be familiar with that term, they're huge server farms that are all interconnected, so to speak, and they're collecting the data on everything, and it's all being tied back to your quote-unquote metadata, which is you. That is that's your human network node on the GIG and the IoT. Hmm. That's you. <laughs> There's uh, have you heard of Stephen Rambam? No. No, let's see. He's a director of the investigative agency Polorium. Anyway, he's an ex-cop, I believe. He's a, anyway, he does a a really good speech on on internet security, and he, he claims that privacy is dead and what have you, um, and. In his one speech, he's talking about people who are afraid of the NSA listening in on their calls and all this paranoia. Um, and he's like, you guys are a bunch of idiots. <laughs> the NSA doesn't need to listen in and spy on you idiots because you're giving your information up free on Google, on Facebook, and everywhere else on the planet. And the NSA, if anything, they're buying the information from them. <laughs> Well, they're working hand in hand with them. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, but I mean, for people to think like, oh, it's this, this big operation against us to take our info. It's like they don't need to because these people are just giving it away anyway, um, and they don't realize it. Of course, I mean that's where it becomes nefarious. But at the same time, people are just here. You go, you know. It's like a big case of Stockholm syndrome. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and I did a, a whole expose, a report on that entitled 2015 uh, Geoint Symposium Final Report. And 
they actually mention just what you said, how mm. this is, you know, like a kid in a candy store, so to speak, where mm. we don't have to go through all this problem. We don't have to go out and identify targeted people. You know, we don't have to do that. Everybody's uploading all this stuff for us. So it makes our job easier. That's basically what they said in, in you know, the final report. Right. Of GeoIn, and they kept harping on the fact, and they're they're selling the idea that a truly free society is an open society. Right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, How does that work in a, <laughs> in a total free society? So what they're saying is, no privacy is a totally free society. No, no, it's it's funny though because like, see, here they are. <sighs> These are plays on words, okay? Like free, free as in beer. Like they got, they've mangled the idea of what society is first and foremost. So to offer up another alternative is just yet another alternative by the puppet masters. If you understand right. the point, they're um, psyoping our vocabulary. They're just psyoping words, you know. Mm-hmm. You no, know, everything is kind of like a, a construct of. Uh, it's like reality TV, if I could kind of use some kind of a loose analogy. It's like it's totally unreality TV, but yet people think – and people know by watching it, the brain tells them it's not real, but yet they're still hooked. And they still use the terminologies, reality TV. You know what I mean? Like it's just bizarre how people can just so blindly – allow themselves to be controlled in that way. It's like the movement for political correctness back in the 80s. Do you remember this? Yeah. I mean, it's the same type of thing. And this was the Americans, like the American media. It's like, I, I, I'm sure this is what it was. I mean, this is after MK Ultra and everything else. When all the research on mind control was accomplished, they literally rewrote the definitions of many things in our vocabulary. Well, the CIA was the one who came up with conspiracy theorists they coined that word right right yeah I, I think it was us that coined reality analyst conspiracy analyst <laughs> or, yeah ah oh, jeez no but I mean you understand what I mean no, like the list just goes on and on like now they've gone like a dimension deeper into it now they're actually reprogramming not our vocabulary but our gender specificity and, and and everything else it's going on a wild tangent now yeah it is definitely accelerating uh, it, it, in the end it seems to be like a, a movement or an agenda to separate the soul from the human being agreed and if Nicholson were here um, he would totally uh have a comment on this because, again, with the whole transhumanism thing, it's not long before they have our consciousness downloaded into a hard drive or into some other empty shell. They're working with uh, synthetic genetics right now. They're working with all these things. They want to create synthetic humanoids. Um, They've the, done that already. I did a report called Transcendence, hmm. up, uploading brain maps of the dead. Right. They're already doing this, but it's it's not available. I mean, they're doing it on an experimental basis, you know, and the um, the forward looking plans for this type of technology would be that if you had enough money, I would suppose um, you could at the point of death, you could upload your brain map to a computer, which could then be downloaded into, I don't know, let's say a cybernetic unit, you know, where you could exist on. After the yeah. point of your physical death. Now, that's all part of transhumanism as well. Yeah. Actually, it's funny. I just saw a movie recently. Um, what the hell was it called? I think it was Selfless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's about that very thing. You know, rich, old entrepreneur guy who's now, you know, multi-billionaire kind of thing. He gets... Uh, he gets the option of continuing on in a new body, and there's a big drama about it. But funny thing is, is that you know, predictive programming has come a long way um, with the different trends that it suggests. I mean, just recently, uh, there was another program called uh, Chappie. 
Have you heard yeah. of that one? That's the one with the robot, which was kind of had a twist in it where the robot figures out how to map the human brain or the human mind or soul or however you want to describe it. And, 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 and works reverse though. Instead of putting himself into a body like the Pinocchio thing, it's like a twist. It's like he gets his, he gets his father or his creator and uploads his creator's consciousness into another robot. So, you get these these concepts are starting to come out into like media and, and you know pop culture, and it's just I don't know, man. Like you, you see, I saw an article where there's a company in ten years will they claim they're ten years are going to be able to download your consciousness into a, into a robot. I'm assuming it could work both ways. Yes, it can. It's a two way transfer. It's a bi directional transfer mm-hmm. uh, or a bi directional connection. Um, and again, what you just hit on about all these sci-fi movies and that, yeah. I am convinced at this point that these science fiction movies, like with the robots and with technology and stuff like that, this is nothing more than advertising for technology they already have. I have to agree with you on that. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. You know? <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I was... Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I was talking to Nicholson. We were just having a chuckle earlier talking about the Terminator movies. I mean, the original Terminator movie in 1983 was cool. I'm sorry. It was fun. That was a good movie. But it's almost become a bit of a, how can I say, uh, almost like a religion in itself. Like, you know, with these multiple timelines and then like like the predictive programming alone in, in Terminator Salvation was just, I don't know how many people saw it, but it was absolutely mind-blowing what they were suggesting in that film. Mm-hmm. I didn't see it. Oh, T- Terminator Salvation, it got, it got into, uh, into nanite technology. It got into like all kinds of crazy stuff like nanobots and what have you and a civil war between them. I don't know. It was just insane. But the things that they suggest um, are definitely some kind of uh, advertising or, or or subtle seed planting, I call it, because like they plant the seed in there. You think it's wild and crazy and out there, but you've already seen it once. So when you see it again, it won't be so out there. Yeah, that's called desensitizing. Yes, yes. So, but, uh, no, what's, what's your take on all of that right now? Like, I mean, see, we do have a new step that we're reaching with the command and control stuff and DARPA actually has on their website now, um, their plans to build a space based command control base. Well, I'm sure you've heard of these companies like, um, oh, I just had a, I just had a brain fart. I just had a senior moment. No <laughs> um, worries. What's they're called? Um, Microsat, but uh, Elon Musk mm. has one of these companies where they're looking to completely encase the globe with all of these micro um, micro satellites. Now, that's interesting what you mentioned about DARPA putting this C2 system mm-hmm. up into orbit. These will be operating on hive-based intelligence. Yeah. So the microsatellites will be the swarm that's collecting the information and feeding it up back up to the hive. Mm. Interesting. That's very interesting. Um, these, what do you call them? These uh, new systems like these, the quantum AI, the command and control system that we talked about with Jade Helm. Um, we didn't really get into all of that very much in detail, but like I said before, all those videos are on your channel and on your website, so I'll make sure I leave links for everybody. Um, but these command control systems, the quantum AI, all of this stuff I think is leading up to a massive uh, control uh, base, like a command control base in orbit. It's better than a hardened target 300 feet below ground. You know what I mean? Like. Mm-hmm. It's that, that's their next logical step. Yeah, and if it's in orbit up above the Earth, it can reach all of those satellites in geosynchronous orbit simultaneously. Absolutely, yeah. So, <clears throat> wow. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's mind-boggling when you think about the implications and, like, who, who can get up there? I mean, only a few of the most uh, advanced countries can even get up there on their own. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's it, that's a good point. Who is going to do this? They're already breaking down nation-states' identities. So it's, you know, is it going to be China? Is it going to be us? Is it going to be Russia? No. It's going to be those few at the top of the pyramid yeah. that are calling all the shots and pulling all the strings. Yeah. yeah. They might sell it. They might sell it like as a, you know, a big leap forward by country XYZ, you know. But – I mean, like you said, at the end of the day, this is all about the corporation. It would be the corporation of China that pulls it off. It would be the corporation of the District of Columbia that pulls it off. It'll be, it would be these corporation, corporate entities that do it. Whether they sell it that way with their propaganda or not remains to be seen, but it's mind-blowing, man. Yeah, it'll either be sold that way, like you just explained, or it'll be sold as a necessity for, um, for defense. Right. Yeah, and of course that's where DARPA comes in. Yeah, DARPA. <sighs> God, every piece of technology they get, their sole agenda is to turn it into a weapon in one way, shape, or form. Yeah, and guess who the uh, <laughs> the what, what do you call it the the alpha testers or the beta testers are? All of you. <laughs> yeah. Because every gadget you have in your home, from the microwave oven to, to the calculator, guess what? should have a sticker on it that says DARPA inside. <laughs> yeah. It, Brought to you by DARPA. Absolutely. Because you know, you know what people say? Uh, I just want to put this into perspective for the people listening. When people say, when you see stuff on TV, like new technology, and think, oh, everything that we don't see is 10 years more advanced, yep, you're right, and DARPA did it. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, I think it's more like 20 to 30 years or more. Oh, advanced. I believe, I, I think you're right. I was just going after the old saying, but yeah, you're oh, okay. right. Yeah. yeah, because they have what they call um, oh, dark tech, all right, and there's different levels of it, mm-hmm. and the stuff that – we see, you know, is the level one, you know, the new and emerging stuff coming out by Apple or Microsoft or Google, that's levels two and three. There's levels four and five, okay? And that stuff, you know, we couldn't even imagine in our wildest dreams. But if you, like we pointed out, if you watch the sci-fi, that's aver- it's pre-release advertising for tech they already have. Hmm, Interesting. Um, and yeah, actually, um, if, if you look at patents, if you look at like uh, patent registrations, take a leap. Look for some crazy stuff. You'll actually find patents that have been reserved. Like they do, you won't find you won't find a design or a description, but you'll find reserved patents. And usually, you'll have things like Raytheon or Boeing or companies with these titles on there. Hmm. But. Uh, yeah, so like it's it like uh yeah, you'll find like empty ones, like empty empty patent numbers and things like that. You mean there's nothing in them or you just can't view them? Yeah, it's just very very erroneous data, just kind of vague. Huh. Cuz I did find some patents now that you're, you know, you're talking along this line mm. on the remote neural monitoring that go back to the 1970s. Ah. <laughs> how they were doing this with brain penetrating frequencies. And, um, you know, downloading and uploading um, um, information from your brain and controlling you not from across the room, but from across the planet. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I did a little bit of reading on remote sensing. Uh, apparently, NASA used some remote sensors to look at the dark side of the moon and other things like that. Like it's bizarre stuff. You mean like remote viewers or? Yeah, remote viewing, yeah. Uh-huh. Did, I say, did I say remote sensing? Yeah, I meant remote viewing. But yeah, apparently NASA had used remote viewers to look at the dark side of the moon at some point. I think it was during the 70s. Mm hmm. And that kind of pre, that preceded a big UFO craze or something along those lines. But, uh, uh, going to, uh, back to the social element here of, of the internet, uh, another thing I've noticed was, the, was kind of like anti-propaganda propaganda or 
anti-propaganda, anti-propaganda. <laughs> it was basically like these movements like the Flat Earth and, you know, uh, the Mandela Effect and, uh, you know, rockets don't work in space and all, you know, fi- dinosaurs are fake and all these other movements that have been started by these uh, other groups. It is kind of like, uh, the, it's a perfect platform for these, you know, we call them trolls, but, you know, disinfo agents, uh whatever you want to call them. Oh, but, right. Yeah. But, but these, you know, this platform is not just created the perfect breeding ground for them, but they also play the narrative out that the sheep, you know, kind of go along with. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's misdirection. It's, you know, diversion. They, mm-hmm. you know, if they want you focusing on something, they don't want you focusing on something important. That's right. Yeah, and I guess a lot of people chasing their tails and stuff. I mean, I, I mention this a lot because it's very important that uh, people have to look at common sense and, and and logic. Often, you know, you know, we call it Occam's razor sometimes, but you know, usually the simplest approach does work. And uh, I'll oh man, I'll give you an example. Like, look at this uh, uh, Mandela effect stuff that's coming out now. Mm-hmm. Um, the only reason I'm going to waste the next three or four minutes talking about it is because, again, it's another psyop in my book. Because if you look at um, the logic behind what it is, it's impossible to prove once you once you realize that if one parallel dimension eats up another, all histories are changed. There's no way to prove the existence of another dimension that no longer exists. It's just not provable. So I don't know why people are making videos about it, trying to... Bunk, uh, try to prove it or disprove it. You know, it's it's literally a waste of time. Yeah, no, I d- I didn't hear about that Mandela effect till a, a couple of months ago, but I did put a report out, and I don't know, maybe maybe it kind of goes along the lines of Mandela effect. But the report was, is a quantum shift coming? And I outlined in it some strange things that seem to be happening. Uh, to people, um, you know, you get people that are seeing what they call shadow people, yeah. stuff like that. Um, uh, there's a lot. There's there's a lot of information or specifics that I picked out and pulled out of, you know, put into that report. But I didn't know what the Mandela effect was when mm-hmm. I did it, but I did know that or have realized that something unusual is happening. I don't know what it is. But if you take into consideration that everything, everything, all life, all power, all energy, everything is Mm frequency-based, kind of like if you're tuning in, you're driving down the highway and you're making a long trip and you're kind of like tuning into your radio station, it starts to fade as you get 50 miles away. And then all of a sudden you start picking up two radio stations simultaneously. You're picking up two frequencies on the same band. Mm-hmm. Is what's happening, and I'm wondering if that's kind of you know what I tried to explain in that yeah. video. What's happening to some of us, to well, some people? It's it's funny. Okay, when you say it like that, I completely um, okay. I want to back up actually and say that like I'm not saying that the effects that people are describing aren't necessarily taking place. I'm saying that trying to prove it is completely. Um, in vain because there's no way to prove something whose history has been changed. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, exactly. But the, the effect itself might be happening. Like if maybe it happens like on a quantum level, it might happen in nature all the time and we're just unaware of it because the effects are physical. The, you know, um, if, okay, there, there, some may argue that the way that, uh, you know, matter uh, manifests itself is in basically the lower three dimensions of existence where entropy takes over and causality kind of is is more influenced, right? Now, in the higher dimensions, if it's energy that manifests itself and kind of doesn't go along with entropy, you get this kind of cohesion of past, present, future. And maybe thoughts could exist on that level but on its own you know what i mean if that's the case and they take longer maybe to get erased or rewritten and this is all completely this is all just in my head by the way guys but the way the way i'm looking at it if that's possible and it does take a while for memory to catch up 
then, you know, who's to say it doesn't exist? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it would be impossible to try to go about proving because, you know. Based on the scenario you explained, and you're right. If you change history or if you change a timeline event, you can't go back and prove that event because it no longer exists. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, but I, I, had, I have a funny suspicion that, yeah, I think, you know, it's very possible that things are being meddled with. Things are changing. And, you know, I think there's also a combination effect here of, like, you know, mass hysteria. I think, you know, suddenly one person says, oh, this has changed. Then suddenly everybody yeah, thinks everybody. something has changed. It's going to jump right. on the bandwagon. <laughs> I swear I brought brown bread this morning. <laughs> but the dangerous part of this, and finally I can get to my ultimate point, is that if this gets planted into the minds of people as a possibility that timelines can be altered, who's to say now that any parties in control now of, of society – can completely just blame it to you know blame things on the Mandela effect. Oh no, it was always like this. You just remember it differently now. You know, I mean, that, is it another scapegoat coming down the line, setting the stage? You know. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a lot of what they're trying to accomplish with CERN. Um, you know, I had a discussion with uh, John B. Wells on this, and what I think CERN is doing is um, they're looking for the God particle, or so they claim. No, they're looking for the technology to uh, to unlock. They're looking for the keys to unlock technology so they can become gods. And I think what they're doing at, at CERN, um, what's how can I explain this? How can I give a visual? What's the shortest point? Um, the shortest path between two points on a piece of paper. Right. You fold that paper. That's right. I think they're looking on how to tunnel through dimensions, how to fold dimensions in on themselves and tunnel through them. Yeah, and you know what? The entire process of entanglement uses what's called quantum tunneling in these yeah. processors they use. And and that, in essence, is like, it's a really abstract idea for those who don't know what it is. But imagine data and information appearing as peaks and valleys. And to get from one side of, let's say, an algorithm to the answer, you have to go up and down through those peaks and valleys to the final end. Well, quantum tunneling would be like going right through those peaks and valleys, like you were saying, like folding the piece of paper and joining those points. And that's, that's in essence, you know, oversimplified as it may be, but that's the essence of what we're talking about. And yeah, and that's how quantum computing works. They don't even know where these qubits go no. and come back with with the information. No, they, they don't, don't even know where they've gone. So, but they know that they're leaving that realm and they're they're coexisting in two places simultaneously. Yeah, and then coming back, reconverging in the quantum computer with the answers to the questions, problems algorithms like you mentioned mm -hmm. and uh, they don't uh, they don't really understand how it's being done they know it, it is being done and it's happening it's like woo -hoo. <laughs> yeah woo, -woo <laughs> science woo, woo computing uh, yes to the great minds that know that don't know what's going on but uh, yeah I mean it's pretty scary stuff I mean that's it's, it's kind of advanced I mean it's even beyond me I just I just understand it at the, at the basic level I've done computer programming for many years and so I understand what you know like and and nor and not gates are and they can do this kind of stuff while these quantum bits are entangled and while they're in this super state or superposition and it's uh, it's mind-boggling even for me being a programmer so I can just imagine someone's like quantum what Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it has to do with, um, you know, throwing um, tens of thousands, millions, billions of what ifs at this thing, and it can process them all simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I on a side note there, I actually read that if you put a regular computer program into a quantum processor, it would be it would wouldn't do that faster than a regular computer. Correct. 
it I've read that too. Yeah, it literally does the more complex shit faster. <laughs> like <laughs> But not the linear computing stuff. Exactly. It linear computing do does yeah. exactly the same. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh it's bizarre how it works. Um anyway, um I'm going to pack it in here, DJ. It's been uh absolutely awesome, minus all the technical difficulties and we lost our guests, but uh we'll uh we'll have to do this again. What do you say? Sure. All right. Well, we'll have to set a date. We'll try and uh, we'll see if you can't get uh, another browser set up. I'll, I'll get some tech notes for you so you could use yours. And uh, yeah, that Windows Edge, yeah? No. Well, I have it, and I can't delete it from Windows 10 without causing other problems with the uh, system. Uh, so, yeah, they like to do that now. Um so I don't use Edge, but some types of applications, internet-based applications that I go to open up, they'll automatically open up in Edge. Yeah. Even though I have my Firefox browser open and waiting, you know, to receive the, you know, the command. Yeah. The, the Edge pops up. So I don't <laughs> like that. I don't like anything that takes over control. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, that where I can't choose. Well, Windows 10, by the way, just everyone out there. I'm going to tell you this, and this is my opinion, but Windows 10 is uh, basically made to watch you. Um, yeah. Just because it's free doesn't mean you should be using it. Right. And I <laughs> wish I didn't have to, but, you know, with yeah. like we were talking about before, a lot of the applications I have on here just would not run anymore. They just would not run properly. And I was having all kinds of problems with internet browsing on 7 Pro. So, yeah, yeah they're, they're migrating everybody. They, I think where, where they eventually want to go is at yeah. some point they want to get everyone on a common platform. Absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah, on theirs. And, and yeah. <laughs> it's funny, too, because Windows, you guys have to think about this company, Microsoft. They've been hosing you for money for over 25 years. Do you think they're going to put out a free product and not have some kind of ulterior motive? Come on, people. We'll wake up. Yep. Exactly <laughs> right. So, But on that note, um, I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, I want to thank DJ for coming in from Level 9 News. It's great to have you. And we should do this again for sure. Um, I want to thank uh, Nicholson1968, who I guess we lost to a thunderstorm. And Professor Doom, may your robotic voice always serve you well. Um, no, we'll have him back as well. Uh, in, 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 I don't know, maybe he had a microphone sound card problem. I'm not sure, but we'll have you all back and we'll do this again. Hopefully a little bit more cohesive. Thank you, Robert. Hey, any time there, DJ. That's right as that sounds, yeah, yeah. Take these walls and rip them, rip them down. Step on, step on.